All right, well, it is time to start. Our next talk is improving guest management via the QMU guest agent. And Michael Roth from the IBM Linux Technology Center will be uh, giving his talk. So thank you, Michael. Right. Thank you. So the QMU guest agent, uh, in a nutshell, is a system level daemon. It runs inside the guest and it executes commands inside the guest on behalf of the host. Now, all of the, uh, the communication between the host and the guest is done over a paravirtual communication channel. So there's no networking required. And that's actually an important point uh, because you might ask, why not just use SSH? Right, you run an SSH server in the guest, you connect to it from the host, and you can run any commands that you want inside the guest. Uh, but the problem with uh, you know, a network-based uh, guest agent is that uh, that causes network isolation issues. You generally don't want your guests to have access to your host management network. Because when you do that, all of the services that you have running uh, on the host or you know, in that same network are now potentially exploitable by guests. So it's, a, it's an additional attack vector. Um, and that's, that's the main issue from a host perspective. From the guest perspective, just the notion of asking users to run a network-based service that provides root access uh, to clients from outside the network is, is, is kind of a hard sell because you might have confidence in the security of, of your host network, but from the perspective of uh, somebody that's just using your host to, to run their guests, providing root access over the network is, uh, you know, is a big deal. Um, you know, maybe you know, your network isn't so secure and any other guest running you know, in that network or, or on that node could potentially you know, exploit your guests. So it, it's, a, it's a security concern and for that, for, because of that, um, a non-network based solution is the way to go. So uh, that's so. Here's a uh, just a, an overview of how all the pieces fit together. Um, we have QMU. It's executing uh, the guest, and within the guest, we have the QMU guest agent running. Uh, QMU also provides the QMU management interface. So when node level management uh, wants to do management tasks, it will generally communicate with QMP. QMP provides interfaces for doing things like attaching disks and rebooting guests, et cetera. With QMU GA, there's now an a, additional interface that Libvirt or other node level management tools can connect to uh, to extend the, the types of uh, management capabilities that, that are available. Um, uh, we also have future QMU here. and. Uh, the idea there is to take the, uh, the QMU GA client and build that directly into QMU such that we can expose all of the guest agent commands over the existing QMP uh, net, uh, management interface. And you know, by doing that, we can greatly reduce the, the complexity behind managing multiple guests you know, at the node level. And that also lets us use the guest agent from within QMU which also opens up some potential use cases. Uh, now, the communication protocol is a uh, JSON-based RPCs. So uh, commands are sent to the guest uh, in the form of a, a JSON-encoded request. And responses are, are received in the form of a, a JSON-encoded uh, response. This is actually the exact same uh, protocol that QMU's QMP management interface uses. And we kind of have a side-by-side -side here uh, for comparison. But it, it, it's the same protocol. And it was done that way on purpose because uh, you know, existing tools like Libvirt, they already know the, the QMU management protocol. So it's easy to plug into the guest agent uh, if we stick to using that. Uh, here's a list of the supported commands. Uh, most of the commands are also supported on Windows. Uh, notable exceptions would be the uh, file access interfaces. Uh, I do have some experimental patches that, that add that, but uh, you know, we just need to get those patches upstream. But that's, that support should be forthcoming. And um, some of these other network, some of these other interfaces may not be so important in terms of Windows support, but things like FS trim possibly. Uh, so basic usage, um, 
on the host, uh, the only thing you really need to configure is the communication channel that the guest agent's going to use. Uh, the dash char dev argument is basically how you configure how that communication channel is exposed on the host. So in this case, we're saying that we want to create a Unix socket at slash temp slash QGA.sock. And in doing so, you can connect to the guest agent just by connecting to that Unix socket on the host. Um, all the other bits are how we expose the communication channel inside the guest. And the, the most important parameter here is the name equals org.qmu.guestagent.0, which is uh, it's an identifier that uh, guests will use that, that some guests will use to determine where exactly to uh, create the character device that represents the communication channel on the guest side, uh, where exactly to, to what path that, that character device sh should be uh, set to. Uh, in the case of Fedora, uh, with, this, with this argument, you'll end up with a slash dev slash vertio dash ports slash org.qmu.guestagent. And inside the guest, you basically just point the guest agent to that, uh, that communication channel. And from there, uh, that's, that's all you need to do to, um, to begin using it. Now, the, the guest agent uh, binary, it's available on most Linux distributions, uh, mainly because it, it ships as part of the QMU source code. So any distribution that has a, a QMU package will also have the, uh, the guest agent there in some form. Um, for a uh, rail-based distro, there's actually a, a separate package for the guest agent, which is kind of nice because uh, generally it doesn't make much sense to install the QMU package inside of a guest. And I mean, you can, you can do that and you could use it, but it'll, it'll be pretty slow. So generally, inside the guest is where you want to use the guest agent. Uh, on the host is where you want to use QMU. So it's nice to have the, the separate packages for rel, but the important thing is that the packages are readily available. You don't need to put together a custom package to uh, get most of your, your guest images uh, you know, over to using the, the guest agent. Uh, so why another guest agent? Uh, th there are other guest agents out there, and there's even other guest agents that communicate over a pair of virtual communication channel. Uh, overt guest agent does that. OpenStack, I'm, I'm not too sure if they use a pair of virtual channel or not, but I, I would assume that's, that's a potential thing that, that would be added in the future. Uh, VMware, um, which may seem kind of odd to, to mention here, but they do actually have an open source guest agent. Uh, it does also communicate over a pair of virtual communication channel via the uh, VMCI sockets, and those were actually recently added to the Linux kernel. So we could theoretically add support for, for VMCI to QMU and, and use the, the VMware guest agent. Um, but there, there's two reasons, two main reasons why uh, we're doing a QMU guest agent, or why we did a QMU guest agent. Um, the first is that we're, we're going to end up needing one either way for some of the more uh, advanced usability features that are offered by, um, by solutions like, like VMware and, and VirtualBox. Things like uh, clipboard synchronization, where if you copy uh, a block of text inside of a guest, and then you want to paste that into an editor you have open in the host, um, that type of functionality requires a guest agent. Things like uh, smart desktop resize, where if you resize your, your guest window, instead of having you know, all the icons and text being really small, you can change the resolution so that everything's still legible. Uh, these are all things that are supported by, by a lot of competitors to, to QMU. Um, and you know, ideally, we'd, we'd want to close that gap eventually. And to do that, we'd need a guest agent. And for that type of functionality, where you need that you know, tight coupling between QMU and uh, a guest agent, it doesn't really make sense to rely on something like the overt guest agent, to have to install this huge you know, uh, management stack on top of QMU so that you could support small uh, common use cases, um, which brings us to the next part, which is some uh, so, some use cases that that QMUGA provides um, that guest agents in general can can provide that aren't currently available in, in to our. Jeez. There we go. 
All right, so the, the first use case is live image snapshots. Now, uh, a guest disk image is basically just a file on the host. Uh, snapshots are just point in time backups of those files. And all of the common use cases for backups also apply in the context of virtualization. Um, you know, if you have a guest that was running the software or that was running software and they had an issue where it ended up wiping out a, a bunch of data and you need to recover from that, uh, you could use a snapshot to recover to an earlier state. Um, on the hardware side of things, to address things like hardware failures, you can create snapshots and store those to multiple storage nodes so that you have some level of redundancy. So even if the drive goes bad, you could still recover the guest. Um, and that type of functionality is, is easy to provide if we shut the guest down beforehand. Because if we shut the, the guest down beforehand, the snapshots are basically just, you know, to make a snapshot, you just need to make a copy of the image on the host that represents the guest file system image, or the, the guest disk image. Um, but we generally want to do this while the guest is, is, is running, while it's live. And that's actually a very common use case. And because of that, QMU has a pretty rich set of interfaces to, to handle live snapshots. Uh, these are all commands that are uh, available through the, the QMP management interface that I mentioned earlier. Uh, just a, a brief overview, there's a block dev snapshot sync, which is a, a point in time snapshot of the guest image. Uh, one thing to note there is that that command is synchronous. So technically, when you run this command, the guest is still live. It's still running. But if the guest ends up getting to a state where it needs QMU to do some work on its behalf, it could end up blocking while this command completes. So even though the guest is still technically running, if you have a, uh, an IO intensive workload, you could still get downtime running that command. Uh, so to address that, uh, we recently uh, the drive backup interface was added, which basically does the, the exact same thing, but it, it spawns off a, a background process. Uh, well, it, it, it does all the work in the background so that uh, we, we don't block uh, guest IO while we're creating that snapshot. Uh, drive mirror, uh, it mirrors all the writes that a guest image makes to one or more additional images. And that basically uh, maps to the notion of a, a continuous snapshot where instead of having a point in time that you can revert to to recover, um, every time the image changes, you take another snapshot. So if you ever have a failure on one snapshot, you can fall over to the other one and not have any data loss. Uh, I mentioned redundancy earlier, and you can achieve that through these interfaces if you use a, a network-based file system. So you can expose uh, multiple storage nodes to a host, and you could uh, save those snapshots to multiple storage nodes to get that type of redundancy. Uh, there's also uh, things like network block device protocol that you can use to uh, point QMU to uh, a, a remote image that's not running on the, on the local node, so you can get uh, redundancy there. Uh, but you know, all of these interfaces, they all suffer from uh, a very common issue uh, when it comes to backup solutions, and that's uh, data inconsistency. So on Linux and Windows, um, you know, there's a, an in-memory write-back cache for disk reads and writes. So every time a process or generally when a process writes to disk, that write doesn't actually go straight to disk. It, it gets written to memory. And that's nice because if you have a process that's doing a bunch of writes, it doesn't have to sit there and wait for those writes to complete before it goes off and, and does other work. So it just writes straight to memory. And then at some opportune point in time in the future, um, we, that's, that's when we actually sync it to disk. And that could be during cache eviction. So if we run out of, of um, out of room in the cache and we need to remove some data from there to make room for, for new data, we'll sync that to disk. You can configure uh, time intervals where if data has been sitting, sitting in cache for more than a, a certain amount of time, um, the operating system will automatically flush that to disk. And you could uh, also control that on a per process basis, where if a process wants their data written to disk, it can tell the operating system to do that explicitly with the, the sync call. Um, but regardless of, of that, you know, just the, the fact that 
there are points in time where data is sitting in guest memory but hasn't been committed to disk. Uh, because of that, you can get data loss and corruption when you do your live snapshots. Because if you take a snapshot of the disk and you have data sitting in memory, when you restore to disk, you know, if you have, say, 10 megabytes of data sitting in, in the cache, dirty pages, and you do a, a live snapshot of the guest image, if you end up having to restore, that's 10 megabytes that you lose. And where that data uh, was originally going to be written, you know, I mean, who knows? It, it could cause lots of problems, or, or you may not notice it. But uh, you could get data loss. But furthermore, uh, you could also get data corruption, where if Linux is in the process of flushing data from the cache to the disk, and it's, say, it's, it's flushing out uh, a file to disk, and it's only halfway done flushing out that full file, and at that point in time, the, the snapshot completes, then when you try to restore from that snapshot, what you could have is a file where half of the data is new, half of it is, is, is stale data. And depending on how that data is encoded, if that was a, an encrypted file, then you could lose that data permanently. Um, so that's, that's, that's a big issue. And um, you know, as I said, this is not an issue that's specific to virtualization. This will happen in any case where you try to back up a file system that's in use. So to deal with that, um, one mechanism that Linux provides is the, uh, the FS freeze system call. And what FS freeze will do is when you make the system call, it'll flush any, any outstanding writes to disk. And then it will freeze uh, any new writes that any process attempts to do. Um, and Windows has something similar, which is the, the flush and hold uh, interface that's provided by the volume shadow copy service. So um, by issuing this command, Prior to doing a snapshot, uh, you, you, you gain two, two assurances. One, since you do the flush beforehand, any outstanding writes are going to be committed to disk. Two, since uh, no new data will be written to disk after the FS freeze was called, you, you'll never have an issue where fully or partially overwritten writes uh, occur after the snapshot. And with those two things, uh, we can provide data consistency in our snapshot files. So uh, QMUGA supports uh, issuing the FS freeze uh, inside of a guest via the guest FS freeze and guest FS freeze DAW interfaces. Uh, it supports it on both Linux and Windows via VSS. And um, Libvirt will actually use that interface automatically if you specify the QS option to the, the Libvirt snapshot command. It'll automatically freeze the the guest file system prior to doing the snapshot. Uh, so the next use case is shutting down guests, which uh, seems like a, a, a simple task, but um, there's actually a, a lot of considerations there. Um, it, it, it seems like a simple task because we're used to shutting down a guest from within the guest. And when you're within the guest or when you're on a bare metal machine, you know, you can power down, halt, hibernate, suspend, uh, you know, all that good stuff. And the machine will basically, you know, do what you tell it to do. The behavior is mostly predictable. Um, you know, you might have to wait for Windows updates to install or something. But if you tell your guests to shut down or you tell your machine to shut down, it will shut down eventually. Uh, we also have well-defined programmatic interfaces. So you can shut down machines from the command line. Uh, you could shut them down from a, a process, from widgets, et cetera. Um, but this is the interface that QMU sees. When you tell QMU to shut down the guest, all it can do is the same thing that you do when you press the power button on your machine, which is it will send an ACPI shutdown request to the guest. And from there, what the guest ends up doing uh, is, is uh, just completely unpredictable. The guest, it might shut down the machine. It could suspend it, hibernate it. It could halt it where, you know, if, if you're on Windows, you'll get the you may now safely power off your machine uh, message, in which case you'll never know if the machine actually shut down. Um, or worst of all, it might actually just completely ignore it. If the guest doesn't support ACPI, then it won't respond to that request. Uh, in Windows, you can tell your guest, your, you can tell Windows to ignore ACPI shutdown requests, so it will just be configured to, to not do anything. Um, 
So the obvious solution is to instead of using the power button, use this, these rich sets of uh, this rich set of interfaces that are available within the guest, and that's provided by the guest agent via the uh, uh, the, the guest shutdown commands, and that's that's also supported on Windows. Uh, hibernate and resume. Um, so hibernate, as you all know, writes the guest memory state to disk so that when you power down your machine, you can still restore your, your working state. Um, this is useful for guests as well. If, you have, uh, if you're using your, your guest VMs for doing development work or any type of interactive work where you tend to accrue a lot of working state that you want to keep around, but working state that isn't necessarily uh, going to be committed to disk anytime soon. You know, if you've got a bunch of windows, a bunch of terminals open, um, you know, just development environments, things like that, um, it, it, it may be a useful feature to hibernate the guest so that you can resume it later. Um, but in the context of virtualization, there's, there's uh, some additional uh, use cases for something like hibernate. One of them is servicing, uh, uh, servicing hosts, servicing uh, hardware nodes. Um, sometimes you need to do Sometimes you need to do tasks that require you to uh, evacuate all the guests from a node. You need to do a kernel update, or you need to update, say, the QMU binary, or you need to replace the hardware, et cetera. Um, you know, so you need to get those, those guests off of the host. And the simple solution is just to ask your users to shut the guests down by a certain date. Um, and then when that date rolls around, all the guests will be shut down. And can do whatever you want, but you know, in practice, you'll tend to actually have to force shut down guests because it's, uh, you know, it's quite often the case if you, you have a lot of customers that they're not going to respond to every email message you send them, and when you do that, um, you, know, you risk data loss. So th there is actually one way to address this problem that's. You know, almost a magic bullet, so it's worth mentioning, and that's live migration. Um, if you support live migration uh, in your environment, then all you need to do is live migrate your guests off to another node, and at that point, you can do whatever you want to the node. There's minimal downtime for the guests. Uh, everybody's happy, but th that's, that's not always a, a feasible solution. Uh, if, you've, if you haven't carefully architected your solution with live migration in mind, um, you, you could potentially run into issues that, that are hard to work around. For instance, if, you're, uh, you know, if your environment supports um, uh, local persistent storage, then that, all that local storage will need to be migrated along with the guest memory. And for one guest, that may not be too bad. Maybe they have two, 300 gigabytes of data. If you have a fairly fast network, that's not too bad. But if you're evacuating the host, then you know, multiply that by 16 or, or 20 or whatever. And if you actually have a lot of nodes, then that could be just a, a tremendous amount of data, and it could uh, become intractable to, you know, deal with uh, transferring all that data over your network to, to, to service nodes. Um, there's also a couple other situations. Um, when we add new features to QMU, we, we don't always add those features with migration support included, um, which, which makes sense because uh, it, it's hard to maintain migration compatibility. So if you don't give new features time to stabilize, then you may end up you know, breaking migration down the road. So a lot of times we'll have new features inside QMU that people want to use, but that may not necessarily support migration, uh, for instance, at you know, currently there's vhost SCSI, IB Shmem. Uh, these are all features where if you're using them uh, for your guests, you won't be able to do live migration. So if, you, if, so if live migration's not uh, you know, a solution that's available to you, uh, you basically have two other options. You could shut down the guests or you could hibernate the guests. Uh, both will lead to a loss of service, but obviously the, the pro for hibernating the guest is that you don't lose uh, uh, guest data. When they restore it, all the data that was there in memory is still going to be present. Um, additionally, if you need to hibernate the guest so you can service the node, once you're done servicing the node, you can resume the guest. Um, so that could potentially reduce downtime for, for your users. Um, but, but there are certain cons to that approach. Um, for instance, if 
that guest was uh, doing something like processing credit card transactions and you hibernated it, there's a good chance that while it was hibernated, that credit card transaction was done through some other means. And then when you resume the guest, you, know, you could potentially end up double charging a customer or something. So depending on, on the application that the guest is running, uh, you know, a, a user may opt to just have their guest shut down as opposed to hibernated. But uh, I, I, there's a lot of use cases where users would prefer, would prefer hibernate. So it's a nice option to be able to expose. And you could do that via the, the guest suspend disk command. Um, How are we doing on time? 12.35, OK. OK, so some other use cases. Uh, watchdog health monitor. So uh, a, a watchdog is a way to kind of track to see that a certain process or a certain machine is still executing properly. Uh, this may be a nice feature to have for uh, a, a virtualized environment where you know, generally when you start up a guest, you'll be able to indicate that that guest is running or stopped. But there's no indication there of whether or not that guest is running, but it failed to boot, or it's running, but uh, you know, there was a, a, a kernel oops and it's completely frozen. So being able to provide some type of feedback on the actual health of the guest is, is a useful feature to have. And, and the guest agent provides a, a guest ping command so that uh, your management stack can p periodically ping a guest to see if it's still responding. And if it's not responding, you can notify users or provide some way to make that information available to users so they can better keep track of, of what's going on. Now, you know, of course, you know, I, for you know, intensive applications, determining whether or not the guest is functioning properly is going to require you know, the, the customer to implement a, a, a more you know, targeted solution. But, uh, just as a general feature, that, that might be a nice to have. Um, there's also synchronizing and correcting guest clocks. So generally, we rely on a, a network time protocol to correct uh, timing issues. And that works most of the time, but there are certain situations where, uh, where it may not. For instance, on Windows, uh, if if the jump in time is beyond a certain threshold, Windows will just basically give up. It'll stop trying to set the clock according to NTP, and your guest will be completely you know, out of sync time-wise um, you know, forever. So there's a, a guest set time and, and guest get time command to actually allow the host to explicitly configure the time in the guest. And uh, if, if you're in an environment where the guest images are where there's really tight integration between your, your management solutions and, and, and your guest images to the extent where you, you provide, say, a, a management interface that can do things like set the guest clock or set the guest time zone, et cetera, then the guest agent could also be used to, to provide those types of interfaces. Uh, IP discovery, um, yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's a fairly common issue where you start up your guest and you don't know what the IP is, so you can't really connect to it. If you, if you're doing that locally, um, you know you can, you can VNC into it, or um, you know you have a, a local UI, and, and you could also VNC into it in, in, in some cases in the cloud as well. But generally, to me, communicate with your guests, you're going to have a, a network-based uh, interface, management interface to, to interact with your guest, and if the guest for whatever reason, is it doesn't come up with the IP that you configured it to come up with, then uh, figuring out how to you know, deal with that issue um, could be a problem. So the guest agent provides uh, interfaces to discover what IP the guest actually leased. So if the guest leased a, a different IP for whatever reason, you can determine that and provide that information via the management interface so that uh, a user can, can you know, recover from that and connect to the new IP address. Uh, trim and hole punching. Uh, so trim support, uh, it, it, it's an operating system for, uh, mostly for, for uh, SSD drives, where normally on a, a hard drive, when you delete a file, it, 
you don't need to tell the hard drive that you deleted it. It's just when you need to use that space, you'll just overwrite whatever's in there. On an SSD drive, um, if, you have, if you overwrite data, that operation is actually slower because the delete operation is slow. So to work around that, there's a, a feature called trim where an operating system can tell the drive that explicitly that it's deleted a file. And in that way, instead of having uh, that delete operation occur in a, a critical path when you're trying to you know, write data to disk at a fast rate, it can do it uh, at, at more opportune times via some type of garbage collection mechanism. Um, QMU recently added support for exposing the trim command to the host. So in the case of virtualization, when a, a host operating system issues a trim command, QMU could actually use that to uh, resize the disk image that represents a, a guest's uh, disk and use that to reduce the, the amount of memory that the, the image takes up. So if the guest creates an 8-gigabyte file and then it deletes it, since you know, we might grow the, the, file, the, the disk image by, by 8 gigabytes, but because of the, the trim notification, we'll know that we can shrink that back down and, and remove those. Um, that actually pretty much happens automatically. You don't really need a guest agent for that, but if you, um, if you have a guest where there's a lot of data that has been deleted in the past, then the, the, the trim command to tell the host that that data has been deleted will never get issued. It's only going to apply to any writes that, that happen in the future, any deletes that happen in the future. So the guest agent actually supports a guest FS trim command, which will say, go through the entire file system and send the delete, uh, notify the, the underlying storage device that you know, for every file that's, that's not in use, for, for every block of data that's not in use. So you could use that to, to reduce the size of a file system image. Um, uh, I, I mentioned there was the file access, the uh, guest file access. So uh, there's a, a, a pretty wide range of things you can do when you can access files in the guest from the host. You can tweak the guest configuration. You can do automatic performance tuning, um, things of that nature. So that, that, that's a, a pretty broad range of use cases there. Um, So just, okay, so future work. Um, I mentioned earlier clipboard synchronization. We are actually working on that. And at the moment, we actually have two Google Summer of Code students that are uh, completing their, their project to, to implement uh, clipboard synchronization via the, the guest agent. Um, guest exec is a potentially pretty useful command because if you can exec commands in the guest, and you can basically do anything. So um, there's actually experimental patches that, that do add guest, guest exec support for both uh, Linux and Windows. Um, so that, that's a pretty extensive uh, interface there. So any, in general, when you, when you add new features, you want to have a, a nice, well-defined interface. But as a stopgap, it's nice to have something like guest exec so you can handle you know, anything that's not covered there. So. That's something we're also working on. And that's pretty much it. If there's any questions. So you said that uh, it has trim features that allow it to uh, recover from large file deletions. But what about frequent file writes that are large sizes and deletions that happen at, uh, at some frequency? Does it, does it compensate for that? Does it know that the disk image has to be cleaned up at certain intervals? Or uh, so I'm trying to figure yeah. out if it would cause it a performance issue, right, where it needs to grow that image, shrink it back down, grow it, shrink it back down. Yeah, uh, potentially. I mean, it, it, it certainly would take, uh, it would cause latency if you're doing hole punching on, on every trim command. So. I think that's actually the reason that it's disabled by default on QMU. It could cause performance issues uh, in that type of situation. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a trade-off there. Uh, 
Uh, so are there any plans to add, kind of when you merge it into QMP, are there any plans to kind of have some kind of knowledge of that there's a guest agent listening in the guest? Uh, yeah, that would be handled by QMU. It's just that the issue is it, it's hard to do that. Right. Right, because if, if at any point in time you say there's a guest agent, you know, alive and well, the user can then just go and, and shut down the guest agent, and that's no longer the case. So basically, the, the best we can do is try to execute those commands and give them a timeout. Yeah. And, so yeah. I'm speaking from the, like, a libvert sense. Mm -hmm. So we, we always have to send a guest ping because there's a bunch of commands that could take an indefinite amount of time. Mm -hmm. So libvert's going to block, but you know, are we blocking on a command that we might never get a response? So like the hack that was put into libvert is to say, well, ping it first, and then that command will, that second command will block until it responds. But the question there is like, uh, I don't know, if there could be like a state that says that guest agent went away in the middle, you know, because libvert's basically going to hang mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. That's a difficult one uh, to work through. I mean, Good question. Good question. Yep. We'll, we'll talk after. Okay. And see. Hi, my question's about uh, backup, and uh, uh, you mentioned three types of backups. You had your synchronous, your asynchronous, and then you had a drive and error backup. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm assuming that's basically that's writing to virtual image files on the host. Um, so my question kind of is around the drive mirroring. So one of the things that people are concerned about is corrupted data, whether right. it's from the user or otherwise. Uh, is there any mechanism to prevent corrupted data from transferring from one drive image to the other in that continuous uh, mirroring process? Uh, I mean, basically, the only way to do that is to have a point in time you could recover to. So while you're doing the mirroring, you could also take snapshots at a certain interval so that if something does go bad, you can still restore to a, a previous state. Many times we get the requirements where uh, we need to configure the guest before actually starting it. Like, uh, if, if guest contains the multiple interfaces, so just assign all the IP addresses, assign the default gateways. So like, just before actually starting it, you can have all the network configuration, like uh, the SSH access or the telnet access. Mm -hmm. So admin wants to configure those kind of things. So what is the best way to achieve this? Like, is it through the guest exec or uh, through the JSON interface? or like? So to actually configure a guest before it starts, is it? Um, yeah, I mean, if it's before it starts, then I mean, the guest agents is, is basically out of play. Um, it's, it it kind of depends on, on your solution because you can you can have activation scripts that run on the image, on an offline image, okay. to configure it, and since you have direct access to all the files on the image. And you can execute any commands that you want inside the host against those files. You, you could, in some cases, have a more powerful interface than what you get with guest agent. Uh, guest agent is more catered toward guests that are already running. Okay. You know, if there's any configuration you could do prior to that, then you know, yeah, it doesn't make too much sense to rely on it. Do you have a plan to? Uh, add some interface to uh, send the command from guest to the host because, um, for example, to implement the clipper uh, synchronization, and if such interface is not existing, uh, host need to query periodically uh, the guest clipper is updated, updated or not. So. Yeah, so actually it's, it's part of the, uh, the clipboard synchronization stuff. Um, there is a... Uh, a guest to host channel that's being added, and we because we need that because if if you want to support something like copy paste, if there's a copy in the guest, the guest needs a way to notify the host about that. So yeah, th there is going to be a, a guest to host interface in the future.
Any more questions? Um, so currently, are any of the guest agent commands exposed through Lipper? And if not, what's the plan to do that? Does it have to wait for the QMP integration? Or? Yeah, my plan was to just uh, piggyback off the pass-through interface that's already available for QMP. Q QMP. Um, but it does use it. Most of the uses are for specific commands, you know, internally rather than being exposed to. A so client. you can do like command line birch, guest agent command, and you have to pass in a JSON string. And so libvirt, oh, okay. libvirt does that, and you can you can pass that by hand, and it's going to spit you back the JSON by hand. Um, there are no pretty interfaces to most of those commands. Uh, oh, the, that's the most recent one that's being added that might appear for the next libvirt would be the IP address gathering. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to know. I, I saw some mention of the, the guest agent interface, and I was, I was poking through the source code to see if it was actually exposed to Versh, and I, I just didn't get a chance to confirm or not, so it's, it's good to know. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.